Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States. Episode 3.7, William Penn, Stuck in England. Welcome back. Now, I am sure that you have all been saying how much you missed me talking about the Glorious Revolution. Well, good news. This week, we are going to talk about the Glorious Revolution. Okay, we are not actually going to spend the entire episode talking about the Glorious Revolution. Instead, what we are going to do is take a look at Pennsylvania as it moves through and ultimately past the 1680s and towards the 18th century. That journey would, of course, be incomplete without talking about what Pennsylvania did during the Glorious Revolution. To look at this topic for today, we are going to focus primarily on William Penn, the colony's chief proprietor. The last time we had talked about William Penn, he was fresh off his victory against Lord Baltimore in his dispute over the lower counties, that area that would eventually become the modern state of Delaware. With the lower counties now at least nominally secure, Penn could hop on a boat and speed back across the Atlantic to his colony, right? Well, no. In fact, William Penn would not return back to Pennsylvania until 1699. I had briefly made mention back in our episode 2.20 that Penn had gotten tied up in affairs back in England. However, at the time, I wanted to wait before going into more detail on what exactly he was caught up in. This week, however, I am ready to dive more deeply into exactly what was holding William Penn back in London, and how his actions would affect both the Quakers and Pennsylvania itself. Before we head back to Pennsylvania, I want to take a moment to explore the relationship between William Penn and King James II. In some ways, the story of William Penn might feel like that of Edmund Andros. Both men were loyal to the Stuarts and enjoyed something of a ride-or-die mentality. The difference, however, is that Andros was a royal governor and really never anything more. Yes, he was close to James II, dating back to his time as the Duke of York. However, his power and influence remained largely contained within the colonies. William Penn, on the other hand, was involved with far more than simple colonial policies. He was working closely with Charles II and then later James II. He was a key player during the exclusion crisis. He was there throughout it all. This really, therefore, is one of the key differences for explaining how things would play out for William Penn as compared to Edmund Andros. William Penn was a direct advisor to James II. When the bottom falls out in 1689 and James II is ousted from power, Penn found himself standing far too close to the former monarch. The political damage to Penn was catastrophic. Edmund Andros, who was every bit a loyal steward guy, was able to pivot to a new reality far easier than Penn was ever going to be able to do. He was not directly involved in advising a now-disposed king, but rather he was able to reposition himself as being an obedient guy who could follow orders, regardless of who is sitting on the throne giving those orders. It also does not hurt that William III had colonial policies that were roughly in line with that of the Stuarts. Simply put, William Penn had placed his bet on the wrong horse, and beginning today, we are going to start looking at the ramifications for picking wrong. Penn was close with the Duke of York, a relationship that he would maintain after James would become King James II. Much of the relationship between James and William Penn stems from his father's actions. William Penn Sr. had been close with the Stuarts, and William Penn Jr. had carried over his father's favor. Though he did not fall perfectly in line with the religious views of Charles II, and indeed Penn would often run dangerously afoul of Charles II, William Penn had an unlikely ally in James II. Well, it may seem like a strange partnership on the surface, a Catholic and a Quaker. Really, it does make some degree of sense. In terms of their religious beliefs, Penn and James II were a million miles apart from one another. They held little in common in their religious philosophy, and in fact, Quakers and Catholics were not exactly fans of each other. However, what the two men did share in common was a position in society as being outsiders religiously. Both men were unquestionably devout. William Penn came from a prominent family and by all all means was set up in a good position to achieve great things in life. Well, he would still be able to put together an impressive resume, 
it was not without its challenges. We see Penn arrested time and time again for his religious convictions, as well as him engaging in constant battles to get more rights for the Quakers. With James II, there is little question that he was a very devout man. It is impossible to deny that his life would have been magnitudes easier had he been an Anglican, or at minimum, pretended to be an Anglican. Without going off on some crazy alternative timeline chat here, it is at least a fun thought of what would have happened if James II had at least nominally been an Anglican. Would the Glorious Revolution have ever happened? It is difficult to imagine that it would have. Surely events like the exclusion crisis would have been averted, as it was James Catholicism that predicated the incident in the first place. William Penn viewed James II as an opportunity to improve life for the Quakers. We discussed James II's Declaration of Indulgence back in episode 2.26, which essentially was a document granting far more religious toleration throughout England. Suddenly, people could enjoy liberty of conscience and worship any way they wanted. It also did away with those oaths of loyalty to the Anglican Church in order to hold an office back in England. We detailed back in episode 2.26 how these changes were, without much question, nothing short of an all-out attack against the Anglican Church. With a Catholic King James II in power, this seemed a whole lot like the opening salvo in re-establishing Catholicism throughout England. Now, this, of course, goes a long ways towards explaining the story of the coming glorious revolution. But what about our story? What does the Declaration of Indulgence have to do with Pennsylvania? The answer is that, at a minimum, Penn supported and pushed the Declaration. Some sources actually pin Penn down to having potentially been the author of the Declaration. Either way, William Penn was either the single biggest supporter of the Declaration of Indulgence, or very possibly the guy who wrote it. Suddenly, this entire episode takes on a different view when it comes to our story. If William Penn is the author of the Declaration for the Liberty of Conscience, it completely frames his relation with James II as something that was opportunistic. Yes, on its face, it absolutely applied to Catholics inside of England. That was the purpose of it and James II's entire reason for issuing the Declaration in the first place. However, the broad nature of the Declaration would have extended past just Catholics and would have included other religious minorities. Remember that the Declaration itself is very broad and simply extended liberty of conscience. It did not extend it to any particular group. Rather, the proclamation extended to all our loving subjects. The three main points of the Declaration were to stop punishments for not attending the Church of England. It allowed people to practice religion as they saw fit, either in their home or at church. And it ended the oath of supremacy and allegiance, which was required to be an office holder back in England, both in the civil and the military sphere. Yes, this does help the Catholics, but you know who else it would have helped? If you guessed the Quakers, well, then that is spot on. The Declaration of Indulgence was one of the most controversial things that James II did and was a step towards the ultimate glorious revolution. With the Declaration, William Penn had loudly declared his support for James II and had linked himself to the current monarch. Throughout the summer of 1688, as the storm clouds began to gather on the horizon for James II, tensions back in Pennsylvania remained high as well. Down in the lower counties, there remained a significant amount of strife, as those colonists were still not exactly pumped up to be part of Pennsylvania. The bigger problem at the moment, however, came from a sharp rise in divisions and internal factionalism occurring within the colony. This split was taking place between the Quakers themselves. Much of this has to do with the broad powers that were granted to the Free Society of Traders in the frame of government. Well, originally planned to help drive revenue and help establish Pennsylvania as a colonial power, in reality, the system was abused as wealthy Quakers were able to quickly gobble up huge amounts of valuable land along the Delaware River. The effect of this is that large segments of poor Quakers were completely shut out. This will come to help explain that rift between the Quakers. What you end up with is two factions of Quakers emerging. 
In one corner, you have the rich Quakers, the group that had made the advantageous land grabs. This group, led by Thomas Lloyd, dominated the governor's council. On the other side, you had the less wealthy group. They turned to the assembly to protect their rights. The problem, however, is that the frame of government had done little more than invest a veto power in the hands of the assembly. The real power of the colonial government in Pennsylvania lay with the governor and his council. Penn was over in London during all of this, meaning that the council was where the power sat. It was the governor and the council that could propose legislation, not the assembly. For those poor farmers seeking help, they had placed their hopes on an institution that simply did not have the power to provide them with what they needed. For William Penn personally, this period of absence from the colony was a time that he grew increasingly frustrated about what was going on there. He was not a fan of the way things were trending. Well, to some degree, you may expect that Penn was being flooded with complaints about the colonial issues they needed help with. The reality was actually quite the opposite. Penn was not in the colony, and quickly he became out of sight and out of mind. This would end up being quite frustrating for Penn, as he repeatedly did ask for news of what was going on back on the ground in Pennsylvania. He would often find himself in the position of having to write back to Pennsylvania saying, hey guys, what's up? Oftentimes, in response, he got answers providing very little detail at all about the colony, and other times they simply ignored him. William Penn was, for all intents and purposes, living in the dark about his colony. To make matters worse, the guy who he had sent over to help get control of the situation and get the colony back under control was David Lloyd, who would quickly become amongst his most vocal critics. As a quick moment of digression, you probably notice that we have both a Thomas Lloyd and a David Lloyd. I cannot confirm that these guys were actually related, however, most of the places where I see it addressed, they are referred to as cousins. Regardless of which Lloyd we are talking about at this point, however, they both now seemingly are hostile to William Penn. As we reach July of 1688, and Penn may have begun to realize just how much danger James II was really in, he would make an utterly baffling decision. Penn had grown increasingly frustrated with the situation in Pennsylvania. Upset over the lack of contact and a continuing failure of the colony to send him money, Penn was none too pleased with how his colony was functioning. The news that did reach him told a story of factionalism and internal squabbling. Armed with that knowledge, Penn appointed a new lieutenant governor to the colony. With Penn stuck in England for the foreseeable future, the role of the lieutenant governor was the single most powerful position in the colony. This person was going to stand in for Penn himself and was going to have tremendous power over the direction of Pennsylvania. So who did William Penn choose for this powerful role? The job was given to John Blackwell. John Blackwell was not a Quaker. He was a Puritan from New England. A Puritan from New England who had spent extensive time fighting for the parliamentary armies during the English Civil Wars. If any of you are sitting around and wondering how you can drop an atomic bomb on 17th century Quaker Pennsylvania, the trick is to appoint a New England Puritan with a military background to the most powerful position in the colony. We have talked about the fact that the Quakers really were not huge fans of the Puritans. Back in episode 2.1, we discussed the Boston Martyrs, that group of Quakers in New England that had been executed for the crime of being Quakers. During our series on the Dominion of New England, we had talked about how the Quakers, who had by that point largely sought refuge in the more religiously tolerant Rhode Island, were pretty thrilled to see the Puritans back in New England getting their hold on power broken up by the crown. In Pennsylvania, it is not as though they had no clue about the Boston Martyrs. They were keenly aware of what had occurred in Massachusetts a few decades before. They knew well of the persecution at the hands of the Puritans that their fellow friends had endured. The result of all of this is that the Quakers really, really, really did not care for the New England Puritans. And now suddenly, William Penn had decided that the most powerful man in the colony should be a New England Puritan. In a moment, we are going to look at the effect of placing Blackwell into power. However, first, I want to look at the question that I'm sure a lot of you are wondering. What was William Penn thinking? 
The answer is that a whole lot of historians have asked the very same question, and there really does not seem to be a clear answer. Based on Penn's writings, he does seem to see Blackwell as being a talented man. There is also something to be said for Penn's hopes that Blackwell would send money to their governor, who found himself in an increasingly precarious position financially in England as the Pennsylvania colony continued to fail to send Penn much-needed assistance. Even Penn seemed to realize what he was doing as he wrote back to the colony that if this does not work out, he would replace Blackwell after a while. Penn may have viewed Blackwell as a way to get around the growing rift between Quaker factions inside the colony. The Puritan Blackwell was totally on the outside of that, and it was not something that was going to control him. In other words, Penn may have seen Blackwell as being something of a neutral party to the internal factionalism that had developed in Pennsylvania. Unsurprisingly, Blackwell's appointment went over about as well as you would imagine. Thomas Lloyd appears to have known about the appointment. Blackwell personally wrote to him in early November. Just to give you a gauge of the temperature in the colony. Upon arrival a few weeks later, Blackwell had assumed that his letter had been lost because absolutely nobody showed up to welcome him to Pennsylvania. Cold receptions aside, things did not get any better for Blackwell, nor did the colonists grow any warmer towards their new lieutenant governor. Thomas Lloyd, as head of the council, that institution where power had previously been concentrated, found himself running a multi-year opposition campaign against Blackwell. Lloyd was determined not to let Blackwell have an inch to maneuver inside of the government. For Lloyd, this ended up being a surprisingly easy task. Lloyd was in charge of the Great Seal, which was necessary in order to make official declarations. All Lloyd needed to do to virtually grind the Blackwell government to a halt is to refuse him the seal, which is exactly what he did. By the time that Blackwell was taking power, William Penn's world had been turned upside down as William of Orange was now in England and was in the process of ending the reign of King James II. We know this story already. James II was captured and arrested. William allowed James to escape and flee to France. William Penn did not flee, and quickly thereafter, he found himself facing charges of treason. Penn was able to keep himself out of the Tower of London and agreed instead to head into a loose house arrest. Personally, he suddenly found himself on the wrong side of the Glorious Revolution. He had publicly picked James II as his horse, and James II was now hanging out across the English Channel in France. Back in his colony across the Atlantic, things were not going much better, as the council's only goal at this point was the complete obstruction of Blackwell. With Penn now dealing with all sorts of criminal charges in England, it meant that he could not leave the country and return to Pennsylvania, something that at this point, he would have really liked to have done. Penn could clearly see that his colony was struggling. He knew that the factionalism had divided the Quakers within the colony and understood that the appointment of Blackwell was not making him any friends back there. Not only that, but he had come under increasing attack within Pennsylvania, and being stuck in England gave him very little chance to defend himself or to attempt to reconcile the colony. To say that the entire episode with John Blackwell was a disaster is an understatement. At no time during his two years in power did he make any kind of meaningful inroads within the colony. He was a persona non grata from the moment he arrived within Pennsylvania. Rather than helping the colony, his presence did little but help to ensure that the only business that got done was to block Blackwell. When looking at the incident with Blackwell, it is important to consider that in a lot of ways his appointment in Pennsylvania was analogous to that of Andros in New England. Well, the Quakers never really did have the systems in place to ensure their own hegemony, as the Puritans did to grasp onto their hold on power, there was no doubt that this was a Quaker colony. The appointment of Blackwell challenged the entire basis for the colony itself. Was Pennsylvania not a Quaker haven? a place where they could be in charge of their own self-determination? Politics aside, the very fact of who Blackwell was made him an existential threat to what the colony believed itself to be. The result of this appointment is that Thomas Lloyd, the man in charge of the council, was now directly opposed and fighting against Penn's self-appointed lieutenant governor. This served only to deepen rifts within the colony 
and did a significant amount of damage to the reputation internally of William Penn himself. Lloyd made clear to Penn that this was not going to work and that he was not going to conduct business with a man like Blackwell. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. What ensued is two years of internal fighting where the only business getting done was Lloyd's continued efforts, efforts that were largely successful to stymie Blackwell at every single turn. Just in case Blackwell's job was not difficult enough, things would become even more complicated in October of 1689 when Blackwell received instructions that he needed to prepare the colony for war. As we have talked about in several of our episodes, there was an increasing concern about colonial war with France at this point. This had manifested up in Maine, and there was increasing concerns about the eastern borders of Pennsylvania. This was a direct affront to the pacifism that Quakers hold at their very core. This is not a problem that is going to remain unique to Blackwell. This would be a serious problem moving forward for the colony. England expected the colonies to cooperate on colonial defense. This is to say nothing of the fact that Pennsylvania itself needed internal protection. However, Quakers would continue to hold strong to their belief in pacifism and oftentimes refuse to take up arms. In December of 1689, Penn came to the conclusion that things were not exactly working out well with Blackwell. Penn wrote to him relieving him of his position and returning the government to control by the council. The council quickly elected Thomas Lloyd as the president, and once again, Lloyd was in control of the colony, one would imagine, much to the annoyance of Blackwell. Penn, however, in what is another baffling decision, does not allow Blackwell to, you know, just go home. Instead, Penn decides to make Blackwell the receiver general, which is the fancy term for the colonial tax collector. Because just in case people did not hate Blackwell enough, this will, of course, surely help. Penn made sure to let Blackwell know that he also expected a full audit to be done in the colony and people be brought forward to answer for their tax debts. This may not come as a surprise to you, but this did not go over well at all. Blackwell had zero luck in collecting anything, including his own salary. Blackwell would eventually have to resort to begging William Penn himself to get paid. The era of John Blackwell had been devastating for the colony. Blackwell's appointment had done nothing but expose those deep fractures that existed within the Pennsylvania colony. The lower counties continued to vent their anger about their situation and had serious discussions about seceding from Pennsylvania altogether. In an interesting twist, the lower counties were about the only place where Blackwell found that he had some friends. Not that they had any particular love for the man, mind you. However, they were more than happy to see Blackwell as an assault on the Quaker leadership in Philadelphia. To make matters worse in the lower counties, they were upset at the long delay in the Pennsylvania colony, declaring William and Mary as the new sovereigns. This delay by the colonial leadership to recognize the new monarchs, nor the response in the lower counties, was unexpected. James II was, in theory at least, good for the Quakers. We have discussed at length the religious toleration that James II promised, and it was something that the Quakers were obviously big supporters of. In the lower counties, however, you have a population that is mostly Dutch, something that goes all the way back to the New Netherlands conquering the old colony of New Sweden. Recall that before he crossed the English Channel, William of Orange was a stadtholder. The Delaware Dutch, therefore, were big supporters of the new king. Penn, for what it's worth, was desperate to reconcile the situation with the lower counties. Despite the continued bickering, Penn was not blind to the fact that he was losing control over the lower counties, something that would have been absolutely crushing for the Pennsylvania economy. Without the lower counties, Pennsylvania would have become landlocked. Not having access to the Atlantic in the 17th century would have been an absolutely crippling blow to the economy. In addition to the increasing difficulties in bringing goods and supplies from Europe, such a move would deprive the colony of the lucrative funds that came through custom duties. Penn, therefore, had all the incentive in the world to ensure that the lower counties remained in the fold. To this end, Penn made several suggestions, including asking for a mediator to come and try to clear up the divisions, 
as well as requesting that the council meet once every three years in the lower counties, a move designed to increase their perceived representation. The situation that had emerged during the latter part of the 1680s and into the 1690s in Pennsylvania had been nothing short of a complete disaster. Internal divisions had grown deeper. The ongoing battle with the lower counties had intensified, and William Penn had done little to help his own cause and had further alienated himself amongst the Pennsylvania leadership. Once Blackwell was gone, what Penn would see was a return to the frustrating status quo that had largely led him to install Blackwell in the first place. Once again, Penn found himself having to write back to Pennsylvania, complaining about the complete lack of contact in news. And if you are curious, the colony still was not sending Penn any of the money that he so desperately needed. William Penn had walked into a situation that was ultimately difficult for him to overcome. His appointment of Blackwell had hurt his reputation back in Pennsylvania. Penn himself was stuck in England awaiting trial on charges of treason. Those charges would eventually be dismissed in 1693. However, the effect of the charges is that William Penn was stuck in England when he so desperately needed to be back in Pennsylvania. However, despite this fact, it isn't as though William Penn hopped on a boat in 1693. It would be another six years before Penn would return to the Pennsylvania colony. This means six more years where the colony continues to move in a direction that is not consistent with his vision, while he is left largely on the outside. Next time, we are going to continue with our exploration of Pennsylvania as we move the colony forward on into the 18th century. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we take Pennsylvania into a new century. <laughs>